Good morning, everyone. We're going to go ahead and uh, start a little earlier here. Um, so uh, I want to welcome all of you to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Columbia Online, a congregation striving to embody courageous love, radical welcome, and deep connection. I am Tim Dickerson. I am a tall, bald, bearded man uh, with a white man with a pink paisley shirt on. And we are so thankful to have all of you here today uh, as we worship online. And uh, we're so happy that we're able to connect with so many folks from Missouri and beyond. Wherever you are connecting, we welcome you. A few comments about our protocol for today's online worship. We are in Zoom and streaming live on Facebook. We are in Zoom webinar mode, so we can't hear you or even see you. So feel free to eat your breakfast in your PJs, and don't worry if your day is a bit noisy. You'll be able to say hello and interact with the service through the chat feature on Zoom and the comments on Facebook. If you're with us on Zoom, make sure to select panelists and attendees so everyone can see your comment. This will be particularly useful when we wish to share joys and sorrows with one another at that portion of our service. A few notes about accessibility. We are using Zoom's native auto captioning service, which means you'll see automatically generated subtitles at the bottom of your screen. If you prefer, you can hide or alter those subtitles by clicking the closed caption button on your screen. We know that auto captioning is never entirely accurate, but we hope it's close enough to be helpful. We will also be providing spoken descriptions of the videos and images we use, and we'd like you to invite you to please contact us if you have any other accessibility or inclusion needs that we can strive to meet in our online worship. If this is your first time worshiping with us, we'd like to invite you to fill out a digital visitor card at the link provided in the chat and let us know a little bit about you. Our minister, the Reverend Molly Hausch Gordon, is away on sabbatical until August 2nd, and we are honored during this time to be served by the Reverend Dr. C.W. Dawson as sabbatical minister. Church member Melissa Bedford is leading the service this morning. I'd like to thank the folks that make our online worship possible. Thank you today for our online usher, Jenny Bosseler, and Caden Ensign, who is reading one of the service elements. And we're always grateful to our amazing staff, April Rodigero running the slides, Aaron Dyka holly preparing digital liturgy, religious educator Jamila Batchelder, music director Jim, Jeremy Wagner, and pianist Hans Bridger Harris. For our prelude, we're gonna share the recording of the piece Joy written by Hans Bridger Harris and performed by the Kansas City Vita's Chamber Choir. The slide shows lavender fields with the sun just peeking over the horizon. Will you please take a deep breath Find a comfortable, comfortable position for your body and sink into this time of inspiration and this space of renewal as you listen to the music.
Good morning. I'm Melissa Ensign Bedford. I'm a white woman wearing a blue dress with orange flowers. I have brown hair with pink highlights and I'm wearing sage green glasses with gold trim. Our opening words are by the Reverend Kimberly Tomchek Carlson. It is not by chance that you have arrived here today. You have been looking for something larger than yourself. Inside of you, there is a yearning, a calling, a hope for more, a desire for a place of belonging and caring. Through your struggles, someone nurtured you into being, instilling a belief in a shared purpose, a common yet precious resource that belongs to all of us when we share. And so you began seeking a beloved community, a people that does not put fences around love, a community that holds its arms open to possibilities of love, a heart home to nourish your soul and share your gifts. Welcome home, welcome to worship. Please join us in singing our gathering hymn, Abide by With Me, performed in the video by Leah Morris. Miss Morris has rich brown skin with short cropped black hair. She wears large black framed glasses and a blue cowl necktie. She is sitting in a sunny room in front of a microphone and playing guitar. Behind her are several guitars on a stand and a large ficus tree. The lyrics will appear in the video and in the chat. Fast falls the eventide, the darkness deepens, still with me abide, when other helpers fail and comforts flee. We now light our chalice, the symbol of our faith in the community that holds us and the bright flame of human spirit that unites us. 
As we share an image of our church chalice on the screen, you may wish to light a candle at home or look in the chat for a digital chalice. Please join me in lifting your voices in homes across our city, country, and world to share our weekly words of affirmation shown on the slide and shared in the chat. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. For our centering moment, please watch this short video of a reading by Starhawk. The images in the video are of the doors of our church, a purple night sky, four hands of differing color skin grasping each other's wrist, and the crowd of our church community standing in front of the building. Community Means Strength, written by Starhawk. We are all longing to go home to some place we have never been, a place half remembered and half envisioned. We can only catch glimpses of from time to time, community. Somewhere, there are people to whom we can speak with passion, without having the words catch in our throats. Somewhere, a circle of hands will open to receive us. Eyes will light up as we enter. Voices will celebrate with us whenever we come into our own power. Community means strength, that joins our strength to do the work that needs to be done arms to hold us when we falter, a circle of healing, a circle of friends, some place where we can be free. And now, as we share an image of lit candles and our joys and sorrows stones on the screen, I'd like to invite you to bring your loving attention and compassionate presence to our community as we share the joys, sorrows, and prayers of our community. Let us hold one another in heart across the distance, remembering our connections and feeling that we are held in love amid life's sorrows and joys alike, now and always. I will begin, actually I won't begin, we didn't receive any on the website, so we'll go ahead and please start sharing any joys or sorrows that you may have and want to share with our community uh, in the chat and we'll read as many as we can. I'll go ahead and start. I'd like to share a joy. Um, this past weekend, uh, my spouse Shannon and I were able to go back and celebrate her grandfather's 87th birthday, and it was a joyous occasion and was so great to get to actually see some family members uh, once again in person and just reconnect to that community as well. We have Marcy who would like to share a joy that Marcy Brennan's father's tumor has gotten smaller. That is such good news, so great to hear.
the mule skinners of BOCO, the joy that Missouri Supreme Court unanimously agreed that Medicaid must be expanded, Pam. That is awesome to hear, absolutely. That is great news. And while we wait for some, for some potentially more, may we just hold in our hearts all of those unspoken joys and concerns as well. We have another one from Tanette Repetto. Joy that Friday I fly to Seattle to see my brother, mom, and sister-in-law. That is awesome. That is, that's awesome. Good for you. Enjoy and safe travels. So please hold in our hearts all of these joys and sorrows that we have heard or are still in the hearts of our fellow community members. And now please join me in the spirit of prayer and meditation with these words from Samantha Gupta. I give thanks for all it takes to be a healing presence and also how simple it is. I confess that I want to be seen as especially good, especially right, especially useful. I confess that I'm still learning an artful skill. I confess sometimes I try too hard or lean in too far or refused to be moved. And despite all my doubts, there are these ones beside me. So you, web of life that connects each to all, you, that we are each part of never, that we are each part of never fall out of and are all responsible for you who energize all matter as matter, heart of sacred experience, you, who love us all as us as you. Today, I ask for the resources to be present to myself, the resources to be present to others, the resources to lean towards what is hurting, the intuition of my body, the trust and shared leadership of these friends, the insight of our collective wisdom, the embodiment of all my skin and bones and blood, the ocean of my being to wave and crest and fall on the rocks of every holy moment. Please join in singing our hymn of response for all that is our life. This video was made by the Kitsap Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. It shows several different scenes, the colors of a sunset reflected under clouds with birds flying, a potter making a pot on a wheel, the sky with blue and black clouds swirling, and children playing in a splash pad fountain in a city park. You'll find the words to this hymn on the screen and in the chat. Needs which 
each other serve for services we give for work and its rewards for hours of rest and love we come with praise and pain for all that is our life for sorrow we must bear for failures made I'm Kaden Ensign. I'm a white person with dark brown hair, wearing a blue shirt with a dark blue overshirt. Our first reading is Brick by Brick by Meg Barnhouse from her book, Did I Say That Out Loud? All summer workers have been building a brick wall along a road by my neighborhood. Against the brutal heat, they stretch a tarp overhead to get a little shade. I've watched them take bricks in their dusty brown hands one by one, butter them thickly with mortar, line them up and tap them down, row by row. One man who looks to be in his 70s is the leader. His skin is the color of bittersweet chocolate. His beard is gray. Slender and tall, he moves from one group of bricklayers to the next, reaching and bending, looking like a heron in a marsh. Then he pauses. He stands very straight. I see him teach the others how to do the work. He stoops over to look at the line of bricks, hands on his thighs, inspecting the work. Sometimes as I drive by, I see him put his hand on the back of the person he's teaching. Often they are both smiling. He looks like he loves what he's doing. I wonder how he can love building walls day after day, handling bricks, teaching the art of bricklaying. Is it the teaching he loves? Seeing how, he, how his students learn what their styles are how their work shows their character. Does he love the wall itself? Does he know when, he, when it'll be done? Does he look forward to seeing it finished? Or does he love the process, the feel of the bricks in his hands, the squish of the mortar, the challenge of making the symmetry of pillars and arches, the geometry of it? I think from the look on his face, that he loves the process. I imagine that he never thinks about the end of the project, the completion of the wall. I think he will go on to the next wall as if it were just a continuation of this one. Then the next one and the next and never be bored. I want to be like that and I am, I guess. In my job as a minister, the bricks are stories. I hear stories of family and work, stories of loss and reconciliation, stories of rejection and disaster, illness and healing, birthing and dying. I tell stories every Sunday and in between, teaching, challenging, confessing, inviting people to learn and laugh and think, brick by brick, story by story, we build a church seeing the patterns, the symmetry, the plain joy 
of setting one story on the other, sustaining, sustained by the strong and beautiful structures they make. We will never be finished. It's okay. We share with you now a video which introduces <clears throat> the poem. The images in the video of water and a variety of docks, piers, nautical rope, and boats. We're building the ship as we sail it, a poem by Kay Ryan. The first fear being drowning. The ship's first shape was a raft, which was hard to unflatten. After that didn't happen. It's awkward to have to do one's planning in extremis in the early years so hard to hide later. Sleekening the hull, making things more gracious. We're building the ship as we sail it, created with work by Kay Ryan. Our second reading is entitled Good Intentions and Incomplete Efforts by the Reverend Sean Parker Dennison. It begins with this quote from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We must develop and maintain the capacity to forgive. If we are devoid of the power to forgive, we are devoid of the power to love. There is some good in the worst of us and some evil in the best of us. When we discover this, we are less prone to hate our enemies. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Reverend Dennison then writes, I've been doing a lot of guest preaching lately, and it's always a little awkward. I often don't know how the congregation is used to doing things. Recently, I've tripped on my robe, forgotten to extinguish the chalice, called someone by the wrong name, and gave the wrong musician the head nod to cue the anthem. Oops. Sometimes I feel embarrassed by my mistakes, but all in all, they are relatively small things, except one. I preached recently in a building that was a beautiful old chapel in the country. Because it was old, it was one of those buildings where accessibility was a challenge. The congregation had just finished, I think the paint was still wet, installing an accessible entrance and bathroom. They'd, install, uh, they'd installed a small elevator before that. They were understandably and appropriately proud and I was enthusiastic in my gratitude as they showed me the improvements. Then they took me upstairs to the worship space and showed me the pulpit, which was up four steps on the chancel. Those steps are not a barrier for me, but they would be for others. And we'd just been celebrating their good work in making the rest of the building accessible. And I choked. I stammered out something like, too bad those stairs are there, which was neither very polite nor helpful in reminding them there was still work to be done. And then I preached from the pulpit, even though it was inaccessible, and even though I had made a commitment to preach only from an accessible place in the room. In this case, 
That would have meant preaching from the floor rather, go, rather than going up the steps to the pulpit. The hardest times to hold ourselves and each other accountably, accountable compassionately is when the work has begun, but there's more work to be done. We want to acknowledge the effort, and it feels a little awkward to say, what a great start. You did something great, but you're not quite there. And sometimes when we're the ones who have begun to change, it's really hard to hear. I'm still going to preach from the floor since not everyone can access your pulpit. And yet, as Dr. King says, we have to grapple with our incompleteness. We have to understand that we, like everyone else, are always going to be a mix of good intentions and incomplete effort, good results, and some things that don't turn off that well. And yes, even good and evil. We are sometimes selfish, sometimes complicit with the systems that do harm, sometimes the cause of pain and injustice. Until we hold compassion for ourselves and others, until we can be forgiving when we fall short, our love is incomplete. How do we build our ship as we sail it to include everyone? It's been close to 16 months, if not longer, since we have gathered at our church. 16 months of no hugs, no handshakes, no smiles or personal greetings of welcome. Although we have managed a life jacket of sorts, by using every piece of technology available to gather virtually. But a life jacket is never meant to be a permanent means of staying afloat. Sure, as we floated in the sea of chaos, we picked up scraps and the scraps have become a makeshift raft of sorts. But the raft is best suited for calm water, waters in short distances. It is easier for folks to come to the raft rather than the raft go to the people at times. Think of those without internet or the bandwidth for viewing services. Without a ship, we've missed out on serving all of our community. Don't get me wrong, the raft has helped us traverse places where ships can't sail, but the ship can sail where the raft cannot. You see, in a perfect world, we would have a ship. <clears throat> a ship with lifeboats that can traverse the shallow shores, a ship with ramps so all could board and railings to keep us from falling overboard. There would be lifts to help us traverse from deck to deck and equitable places for us to gather. Places that have smooth floors to prevent falling and HVAC systems that filter the air so that those with compromised respiratory systems can breathe freely. You've probably guessed I'm not really talking about a ship and I've probably taken this whole metaphor too far. But as soon as we, our community, started returning to normal by gathering in small groups and talking about in-person Sunday services, it started me thinking about our building. For the last 16 months, our building has been in port. It hasn't been unuseful in port. After all, it still served as a shelter for our unhoused community. But a ship that has set in port too long requires a good going over and serious maintenance and upgrades before it can sail again, or at least have a plan in place so it can be done as the ship sails. Our community has always built our ship as we sail it. In recent years, this included building a shower facility for room at the end guests, and adding building signage to direct guests. We have also known and recognized that our building isn't perfect. Our future elevator shaft is a good example of this. For as long as we have been members, close to 15 years, there's been a sign that reads future home of UUCC elevator. 
It's a small sign. You might not have even noticed it. I've been thinking about our church building a lot lately. I miss the warm welcoming space it offers us to gather. However, I've also been thinking about our church differently. Over the last year, I've had some medical issues come up that make climbing stairs difficult. When you have to make changes to the way you move around your space, you start to think about your spaces differently. For example, you might think, wow, this is effed up. I wonder how else this space is messed up for others with different needs. If you're a 100% fully abled person and you, you don't tend to think about your spaces this way, it's one of the reasons the OTE and PT programs at MU require the students to use wheelchairs to maneuver campus. You can't know what you don't know. I've often thought I was a bit more understanding because my spouse has MS and we've had to maneuver our spaces differently since their diagnosis. But until you've been in someone else's shoes, you just don't really know. At the last board meeting, we gathered at our church. We met, we met in the centering room and upon arrival, I started to park in the main lot. But then I remembered the stairs and I decided I didn't want to be in pain after climbing the stairs after the meeting. So I drove to the back of the church and parked in the lower lot where we have a few spaces to park. It was great until the end of the meeting when everyone went up the stairs together and I walked out alone to the lower parking lot level. Just in case you're wondering, it can be kind of creepy at night behind the church by yourself. I'm kind of wondering how returning to church will affect the way I participate. If after church there is a meeting I need to attend, do I participate by driving my car around back to the lower level? Or do I just skip the meeting because it means running out to my car in the cold or wet? Honestly, if I'm making it out to my car, I'm more apt to go home than to drive around to the lower lot. Where I, might not, where I might not find a space and I still have to get cold and maybe wet. How many others have had this thought? How many others see our mission of radical welcome only to have a partial experience because our building prevents them from participating fully? We say we're radically welcoming, but are we really? The truth is by having a two-story building, where church participation occurs on both floors with no lift or elevator access, what we are really saying is we are radically welcoming only to those who are able to maneuver around our building. And we've known we can't serve everyone because for years we've recognized it with a sign that reads future home of UUCC elevator. How many members or potential members of our community have we lost because of unmet intentions. I love our church. I love our congregation. But I feel we are failing to truly be radically welcoming. I feel what most see as a convenience isn't a convenience for someone else. The good news is that we, as a congregation, are really good at practicing grace. And we have always built our ship as we have sailed it. We've always sleekened our hole and made things more gracious. As Sean Parker Dennison mentions in his piece, good intentions and incomplete efforts, the hardest times to hold ourselves and each other accountable compassionately is when the work has begun, but there's more to be done. We want to acknowledge the effort and it feels a little awkward to say, what a great start. You did something great, but you're not quite there. As we make plans to return to our church building, we need to grapple with our incompleteness. We need to listen to our accessibility team. We need to hear their voices. Ignoring them causes harm to our beloved community. 
I can guarantee that an elevator is only one thing that needs to be resolved. We need to think outside of our able-bodied privilege and practice our call of radical welcome. Our church is part of the story that we are building brick by brick. We will never be finished with it. As we return to our church building, it is important that our building serves all of our congregation and truly is a place of radical welcome. As stated in a blog by Ashok Kara, we're building the ship as we sail it. We're committed to being works in progress. As a result, grace is possible. We can be gracious as long as we're willing to recognize our rough edges and how we've been wrestling, consciously or not, with our own formation. Now is the time in our service when we join in the spiritual practice of generosity, guiding our hearts away from the fear and scarcity all around us, and remembering that it is by sharing and supporting one another that we feel most human. Our offertory this morning is the hymn, We Would Be One. This video was also made by the Kitsap Unitarian Universalist Fellowship. It shows scenes of rays of sunlight shining through the tall trees of a forest, purple wild flowers in a field moving with the breeze, and the subtle ocean waves below a blue sky with clouds. Well, we seem to be having some technical <laughs> difficulties and it's all good. <laughs> you know, as I said, we're kind of floating on this, this put together raft that's not, oh, there we go.
Our closing words are by the Reverend Sean Parker Dennison. Dear spirit of love, help us understand that to be human is to be always learning, always growing, always incomplete. Let this knowing enlarge our compassion for ourselves and others. Help us grow in our capacity to forgive and to accept forgiveness when we make mistakes and in this way become more capable of loving ourselves and each other. Amen. Please join us in singing our, our benediction. The words are on your screen and in the chat. Oops. Now on leaving one another, may we give of hand and heart. Let us share our benediction lovingly before we part. Please join us at the link in the chat or the meeting ID on the side on the slide for coffee hour when we get a chance to see one another's face and catch up in small breakout rooms. Thank you for spending a part of your morning with us and have a wonderful day.